I think what we'll do is we'll start with the discussion items for for Craig, mm -hmm. and then uh, and then we'll go into the other part of the meeting after we do that. So when we get to the other part of the meeting, someone remind me we'll we'll uh, review and approve the minutes of meeting and the usual activities. Plus we go through the action item list, <coughs> and the work list, and everything else. So um, there's hard copies of the discussion list that we're going to do with Craig. So if you want to grab one of those, and uh, anyone else need one? <coughs> So, um, Craig, you have this thing list. Yep. I'll turn it over to you. Sure. And we'll run through <coughs> various items. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I have one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'll just tick through some things. Some things that we will be a little more in depth. In. I'm, this is super informal for me, so you guys like that. Likewise. Ask questions. If there's, you know, I want to make sure that we got things worked out. Um, and preparing you guys for your piece in the uh, dredging project in the fleet. So, I'll sort of give you a status of where we are. Um, we are uh, pretty much complete with our plans and specifications the and the draft solicitation. Okay. Um, At what point can we see those? You guys won't be able to see those until we open them up for the public. So oh, we, we don't even see it in its bid package splendor. No, no, you don't. Oh. Okay. Um, only because it's there's some current you know concerns. I'm not you know speaking of any folks here in the room, but in times past when that has been done, things have been have gotten outside. So well, I'm not talking about the bids themselves. I'm right. talking about the RFP. I mean, even though RFP, we don't want to give you know so a, say a certain contractor an advantage over another, and that could just be time. To, right, so we don't release any of the documentation until it's releasable to the contractors to make a um, sure okay. a bid. But we can see it at that point. Absolutely, okay. and then if there's, you know, it's one of the goals here is to make sure that you guys have all their information in me, or you ask any questions, so we can change things and make sure that we've got, um, you know, local perspective. But really, there is very little given the type of contract. This is a mechanical dredge contract, um, and we can I'll go back over this when we get to the items. It's, it really is um, trying to get the moorings out of the way if there's any in the federal navigation project itself, um, and then and there aren't points of contact that kind of stuff. They're going to float their equipment in, do the work, and float out. Um, they don't require a lot of like lay down areas or anything like that. If it was a hydraulic dredge project, there'd be substantial more lift on the well fleets folks, um, but it's not the case. So um, so maybe I can just sort of walk you through. It is going to be a mechanical dredge project. You guys probably know that. Um, Do you envision that would be a clamshell or an excavator? Um, contractor's pro choice. Contractor's choice, ultimately. Um, we, don't, we, pers we don't be that prescriptive because that will force us into a situation where we're just making ourselves, making it more expensive for, for ourselves. But I would envision um, a, a clamshell. I would not expect an excavator. Uh, the material that you guys have here in Wellfleet is, um, you know, you guys call it black mayonnaise, but usually we don't Custer get... Custer now. Is it the uh, <laughs> Custer? Yeah. Scientists up in Coast Studies <laughs> call it. I, I love it. Um, you know, usually we would see a excavator when there's a pressure that needs to be applied, so like a heavier okay. sand or potentially rock or something of that nature where we can really dig at stuff instead of just scooping. So we really do expect we're actually putting mechanical dredge as the dredge type. Ultimately the contractor will decide what kind of mechanical. Um, now so we have to provide an area where during that period that if you know at night they, where they dock it or store it that, or if there's a storm like a hurricane in yeah. November Right. Where it's going to be maybe for three or four days? Yeah, so we should, we should definitely talk about that kind of stuff. I don't, you guys are fairly protected in here. Um, I would not imagine that a significant storm is probably going to, like they spud down, they have the big eye beams. Yeah, down. they'll lock right in. Yeah, like you guys can't probably provide us any more cover than Wellfleet normally is. I mean, we might not have that scenario in other coastal communities in New England where they're really you know, like a rock port where it's just, you know, waves and wind action all the time. You have to seek cover, but my guess is they'll, um, if the winds get too high, 
Uh, they'll just stop work for a few hours or a day or two, depending upon the severity of the storm. They also wouldn't have the ability at any point during the tide to seek a more shelterly place because they're digging it down to a draft that allows them to move. They couldn't go anywhere other than what they have dredged because they have to have a tug to put them there. So yeah. I would assume, as they have in the past, and this situation has come up before, they just leave it right on at the workstation that mm. where it sure. is. They're yeah. locked in yeah. in four spots. And yeah. I would imagine the dredge itself probably has a, <coughs> a draft of four to five feet, and then some of the scows that we're expecting them to use will have it upwards of 10 or 11. So they're loaded. Yeah, I mean, like they'll at, at, at full capacity, they'll be 10 or 11 feet, but um, they flew in like one or two. So you're right, they won't have anywhere to go really. They're just going to beach themselves if they try and go. That goes for the scows in the tumble. Yeah, yeah, they're the ones that draw more draft than the um, actual dredge itself. But we don't, you know, that'll be something that I'll talk about in a little later. Once we get, when we um, determine and award the contract to a specific contractor, we'll have a pre construction meeting with Wellfleet involved. Okay. Good. So that we can make sure points of contact and things like health and safety where somebody, God forbid, has a heart attack on the dredge or an issue where there are points of, um, you know, getting them out. Um, all that kind of stuff will be discussed in a pre-construction pre meeting with our construction over oversight folks. If I can interrupt for just one second, sure. Craig, would you introduce yourself yeah, for sorry. people who are watching at home? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm uh, Craig Martin. I'm a uh, navigation project manager with the New England District Army Corps of Engineers. Thank you. Sure. Um, is, there a, um, is there a time of completion in the contract that you'll be putting in? There is. So how we obtained, so this sort of gets on to the number two about um, approvals and appropriations, is that we have received the funding for Wellfleet that's in place. Uh, we got that. That's a big... Yeah, that was a huge. That was a huge step. Yeah. Um, so we have right now over over five million dollars um, to complete the plans and specs. Um, do QA QC over the dredge contractor. We'll have construction folks here, and we'll just be the dredge contractor, and then the a package the award to the, the dredging contractor itself. So um, we have all the permits necessary. We have, we are, I think the Colonel will probably sign our final EA Fonzi um, early next week. So as far as permits and all that kind of stuff, that's all done. Um, Could I ask one more yeah, question? Yeah, because sure, I have a question too. Um, are we working off a benchmark of yardage that started out probably at a lower <coughs> volume than is actually there now. So the last time we did a we did a condition survey in Wellfleet was um, around this time in 2018. So well, there is going to be fairly close. Yeah, yeah. And we've we've looked at sort of the progression. We've done a number of condition surveys since it was last dredged in '95. Uh, so we have sort of a projection of where it will be. It will be more than what the the 2018 survey says, but not a lot more. Um, or we're predicting about 165,000 cubic yards will come out. And that's both the required um, volume and then what we consider over depth. Um, How much over depth? One, one or two? No, that, that 165 includes that entire amount. So it's like 135, yeah. 20. 135 required, 20 over dredge. Yeah, um, okay. And for folks that don't know, required is just gets us down to the authorized depth. Right. And then there's another, um, actually two feet because, uh, um, actually, no, maybe it's one feet. One feet where they can dig and we pay them for it to achieve the tent because it's an imprecise sign. Yes. Dig it underwater where you can't really see. So, so will the 2018 survey data that you have, is that part of the RFP that the contractor sees? It, it is, okay. and there will also be a pre-dredge survey conducted by the Corps to sort of get that yeah. benchmark 
volume. Um, and when would, when would you expect that to be done? That's going to be done uh, probably within the, as close as we can get to the beginning of the window. So stepping back sort of to the permits and whatnot, um, the water quality cert um, that we got for the project allows us to dredge from October 1st to, to, January. to December 31st. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be, we're going to need every single bit of that window for the amount of volume that we've got to remove. So, that's one of the reasons why the solicitation is coming out earlier than um, a lot of the ones that we would do for a fall for the New England district. You know, our, we're expecting to have the um, issue the RFP mid-May, 13th of May is what I have on my schedule. Um, so 30 days after that, that's when we would have an idea of um, the, the bidders and what the, the price would be. Yeah, okay. So you're giving the impression that it's a lot to take out so that 90 days is, yes, big, you know, to fit it in. Yes. But now suppose you have a weather issue. That's built or in. Or some it. other mechanical issue. Right. And then what happens to Man. that? You don't have it all out. Can you go over to the next year? Or would you go over the, to the next year? The water quality cert would allow us to do that, but we're going to do everything we can to have a contractor remove it, including we've got um, in the contract, we have a certain cubic yardage per every 30 days that they have to obtain. That way they can't. Yeah, Sand, arrive late sandbag, yeah. and then say, oh, well, we just didn't get finished. So um, for completion, they have a certain cubic yardage, which will be in the RFP when you guys see it in May, to allow the contractor to keep pace so they don't get to the end of the window and say, well, we've only completed How do you course. verify the cubic yardage through another, another sounding round? Yes, so when they get paid, They'll, they break it up however they want to, but we generally have them do it in certain percentages mm -hmm. so that um, we can know how fast they're doing stuff. So anytime they want to get paid, they have to do a, 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 a survey, mm -hmm. and that's what we base our payment off is the volume removed. So... Um, do you do the survey? Or do we, the contractor? The contractor does the survey, we verify it. There's a... a so your verification would require... If we want, when we get to the end of the project, um, we will do an after dredge survey to confirm everything has been removed. And but he's getting paid in stages. He is, but the payment at the very end is held. Okay. And we we're gonna we always break it out so that the government is never gonna pay for something that the contractor has not yet done or had not been verified. Mm -hmm. um, so we work with the contractor. They give us updates on things. Um, this is a contract where we're expecting it to be a large, unrestricted business. Mm -hmm. um, there's just too much to take out and too short of a time for it to be a small business contractor. Mm -hmm. uh, we did our acquisition str uh, strategy, and that's what we've determined for the project. So you're going to see like a bigger contractor that's generally um, a little easier to keep on pace and uh, a little more experienced. The minimum yards per every 30 days, I assume, is going to be in the neighborhood of 70,000. Yeah, something on that. Okay. I'm not sure. Um, we haven't gotten the final amount, but pinned down. But that generally there. Sure. That's their calls. Um, yes. Chris, have you tied down or gotten any closer to our question about getting from the channel to the launching ramp? No, that was, we're going to pick it back at the end. <laughs> the on on the state, the state end of it. Uh, well, we want to talk to Craig first, and yeah. then the idea is to make sure that our town procurement process allows us to piggyback, and, and I'm sure it allows us, we just need to make sure we put the right paper in place, yeah. Yeah. and we're looking for guidance from you as to any any uh, restraints to doing it. Right. Uh, probably he has to finish your work first. Absolutely. That's what usually, um, so we do, piggyback um, works out in a couple of different ways. Um, Piggyback, we usually tell the you know group or entity that's one you know this. Sometimes it's a town entity, sometimes it's private marinas or you know whatever. Yes. That you know as soon as we identify and you know, award the contract, that's a level of comfort that that group is doing the work. Um, for us, the award uh, is like the middle of July. So that was that will be when the town knows contractor A is going to be doing the project. 
So if we back that up, we probably would want to contact the, the bidders ahead of time so that they can get their pencils out sure. and, and be prepared to go. So then when you pull the trigger, then if we're in a position to, we can pull the trigger. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, that would absolutely obviously be up to the town on how they want to handle that. But that might be a solution where you get a little more time. Sure. Um, so. Um, Before we leave permits, is there any issue about, and I just heard about it today, and maybe it only applies to our town portion, not the channel, but mitigation with respect to um, NMF, is that it's still an open issue, and National and Marine Fisheries, I guess? No, we've, we've closed out any kind of issues with National Marine Fisheries. Okay. Um, yeah, well, I think we're in the clear, and, you know, we're working pretty diligently with the town, um, you know, especially with the, the Terrapin related issues, <coughs> the town has really stepped up to, to make the, the project happen. So um, I think from the course perspective, we're ready to move on to construction. Great. So um, let's see one of the other things you guys have listed here. Let's see. Um, there will be a requirements on it within the contract that has us using a closed environmental bucket. And that really is, as part of the water quality certification, that's essentially a protection measure for the shellfish in the area. It's uh, just a bucket that has a sort of a flange that allows um, water to sort of be, when it's scooped, water is sort of expelled in the process. So when it's carried up to the water column, you're not just like having muds and things hammering on mud well yeah so. exactly so that that was um one requirement that we are working into the contract itself um otherwise you know we have expected them to be working 24 7. i think one of the things that we are going to need from you guys is any kind of uh, town bylaws on light or sound those kinds of things so that we can make the contract put that in the contract so that um, we can keep, you know. I think our bylaw is seven to seven, isn't it? Something like that. I think it, uh, maybe in residential eight to seven, but yeah, I don't, I, I'm writing a note to check that. Yeah. Yeah, this is on our action list. We need to give it a little more attention. Cause, yeah. Right. Yeah. Because that stuff is absolutely things we need to work into the yeah. contract to make sure that we're, you know, it's going to be a busy, busy three months. Um, but we want life to continue for wealthy citizens as best it can. Well, you know, the last time they dredge the same routine, mm -hmm. mechanical dredging, they dredge 24 hour yeah. shifts. So they're going to have to. It is. Right? Yeah. This 24 is, 7, I think, is a given. Yeah. Is there yeah. anything procedurally that has to be done to, to obviate any, any complaints? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, a lot of the, we, we always have the contractor, you know, focus their lights down on the work, you know. Um, it is big machinery. I don't know who yeah, the citizens that are nice. within, you know, direct earshot of the work. Um, you know, it would help if we were to communicate, and that could be, you know, the core's part and the, the town's part to help educate them about what the dredge process yeah. is. And I mean, it's a crane to lift the bucket up and down. There is some planking. Um, There's also quite a roar when that engine goes into yeah, right. under the torque load. Yeah. You can hear it for miles. Yeah. So that, but a they, letter to the same people that uh, were upset about the loud music at the Pearl. You know, that wasn't even there. I would suggest that the town just <laughs> do a courtesy letter yeah. to make them yeah. aware. Not don't ask them for permission. Right. Yeah. Just make them aware of it politically. It would be wise. So we had a part of a PR process. Yeah. Maybe, you know, yeah. yeah. We had a project in Connecticut, right at the mouth of the Connecticut River. It's um, Old St. Brook, North Cove. And it was a re essentially a, a small cove with a ring of houses around it. And, um, you know, the contractor was sort of forced to put on special, like, hospital grade mufflers to be able to, because they're, they're like, um, requirements were like 40 decibels after seven or eight o'clock so we just want to make sure that's, that's yeah it's pretty quiet it's a pretty, yeah. pretty silent water helps carry you guys you guys know water helps carry sound quite a distance so that kind of information would be super helpful so we can make sure that it's in our contract specifications i find it a nice sound myself it's the sound of progress <laughs> that's right
<laughs> there is some recognition that after this. People might really love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they probably they're, they're will. They're saying t-shirts. What is going to be left? There won't even be a harbor here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We just have to remind folks, hey, at, at the end of this, you know, it's going to benefit the town in a great deal, you know. Um, that would be helpful if you wrote a letter that we could use because we want to submit a grant by the 31st of March. Okay. So that would go in with our application as a backup thing that, that um, you're fully supportive of the town, that this is something that's urgent, that has safety attributes to oh, it absolutely. in terms of access to our boats going out to the, you know, the uh, harbor master getting a boat out year round. Yeah, absolutely. Safety. That's one of the things that really drove um, the project's um, appropriations was that, you know, you guys respond to things for Coast Guard and, you know, it... it, it yeah, you can put all that type of stuff in there because it will set us apart from 72 other towns and yeah. where we're going against only four or five projects being accepted. So award or mid July, we'll have that pre-construction meeting with the notice to proceed. Probably a, within a couple of weeks of that, I'll um, send you guys a, a slew of dates because we generally like to have them on site so that the town can participate. Folks like yourself, also folks like um, um, chief of police or chief of fire, so that. You know, you've got this huge, big equipment come in, and if something goes wrong, we'd like to have the right people at the table with the contractor, so that everybody's on the same page. Like I said, it's like emergencies, and you know, making sure that um, safety is our number one consideration. So, would you suggest that, uh, if possible, we should have it down at the harbor, as opposed it, to here? It's just logistically, if we yeah, can. we've done it a couple of different ways. We've done it like meet here and then go down. Okay. Um, have sort of informal conversations about like, well, what, you know, they will tell us our plan. That's the goal of the pre-construction meeting, like when they're coming, right. you know, how they expect to do the work, what, you know, how they're sort of going to attack it. Um, we could definitely go down if there's questions like afterwards and, you know, discuss things at the, okay. the harbor itself. Um, I will say that it's, it's a requirement for the core. Um, it also includes things like uh, Davis bacon wage stuff and so there's some parts that are very informative for the, the local community and there's some parts that are just like very yeah. dry. Yeah. Um, so we, I generally set it up so that um, the town participation is sort of the first hour and then it's sort of core and contractor making sure that we've got like okay you have your safety health plan and is that coming to us because we review all their stuff the second hour. Um, so we can we can work out some kind of plan. Okay. Yeah. Um, it makes sense for for everybody involved. So. And then you know our expectation is that the contractor would mobilize uh, because it's a mechanical dredge equipment. There's not a lot to set up. They sort of do float in, spud down, and can start work. Um, so probably the last couple of weeks of September. Um, there's, you say there's no moorings in the Federal Navigation Project. I think we identified one that was lost. There's a possibility of one lost. Yeah, and we have that already yeah. in the contract itself. So they'll, they'll take care of that for us as a part of the contract. Um, but we'd ask by September 15th, at the very latest, that if there's mooring, even you know temporary moorings, to have them out of the way so that we're not preventing them from starting yep. work. Because mm -hmm. we we absolutely need them, you know. They'll probably start twelve oh one on October first, just because we have so much material to move. Um, you know how how they figure out stuff and what job they're coming from. We'll hear from them during the pre-construction meeting, but I sort of expect um, them to use the entire window. Sure. So. They will obviously be occupying pieces of the Federal Navigation Project at times. They are required to move um, as a part of the project, you know, get out of the way of incoming vessels and whatnot. 
what we would ask, and this is something we can bring up the construction uh, pre-construction meeting is uh, that we don't have one-off vessels coming through every 10, 15 minutes because the more they're not digging, the longer it is to take. So if we can like maybe work with um, boat owners and and commercial entities that use the project on a regular basis, we can queue them up for like, okay, try and go out in this window for the next 20 or 30 minutes and then let us work for the next four or five hours. I know when people come out and come and go when they, they can and when they need to, but we would really like it to be super um, beneficial for the project and sort of get them out of here is if we can limit the number of pick up and set down because there, there will be your uh, photo navigation project is 125 feet wide, and depending on how they're oriented, you know, they may take all that or three quarters of it. Dennis, how did that go when they did it in the past? It was it never an issue. I never had to see them pull up to get out of the way to, you know. Most of the boats come and go on, they'll go on up traffic, go right around it. Yeah. You know, at the time. Yeah. Yeah, they've worked the time for three years. Yeah. So, uh, nonetheless, so we, we had talked about doing a public outreach, it's on our list of things to do, so in addition to the description so people know what's going on and sure. what they might experience, noise, lights, whatever, we'll, we'll put in about boating access. The, the idea is that the dredge not move, I mean that's yeah. just I mean, that's basic, basic it's unreasonable uh, yeah. to pull, Absolutely. pull it up, um, move the barge as well. Right? Yeah. yeah, we'll make sure everyone understands that the, the uh, mooring removals, more of an issue for our subsequent judging for the town that is the channel yeah. and um, and I think we also had talked about identifying where the shellfish grants are in proximity they're not in the channel but just hey they're over there that was that would be significantly yeah. helpful if that's kind of information we could plop on a map so that there's you know no you know because sometimes they do have to spike yeah. down outside the channel yeah and the idea that we know where the stuff is and we can put it on and say don't you know no spudding in this area that would help. Okay. Um, so if that's something you can get to me, um, pro I don't know if it's something you can get to me in the next couple weeks. Um, I've seen versions of it, I guess. Craig have, or Will, have you seen? Uh, of what? Location of shellfish grants with respect to the channel. We, we had a little yeah. late half by 11. Yeah, they're all permanent. Yeah, so, so, so about that, I think. Hey, can you dredge up that document? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll get it to Craig. Okay. Yeah, Nancy will have that as well. Okay. Well, technically, there shouldn't be any in it. No, no, there shouldn't be. Um, that's not the case in other projects. However, what about what we used to call um, finding the point of repose? And at the top, you can drift beyond the line back into stuff you don't have control over. Right. Do we have that situation? I'm sure we do. There's got to be slumping of the sides. Yeah, so the way we, um, so, so the generally it's like a three on one slope. Yep. So they can technically dig outside of the channel itself um, to obtain that so that when, you know, if you're just digging in the channel, that stuff that's right next to it is just going to- It's just going to collapse. Yeah, yeah, right into it. So we do give them the, the ability to dredge on a sort of a, a surface on a three to one slope. So it used to be called slope rights. Yeah, yeah. I, just, I don't think it's called that anymore, but. Uh, it could be part of a grant in yeah. a slope. Right. That's what I'm talking right. about. So in the case of the channel for um, Wellfleet, you're looking about 30 feet beyond. <clears throat> yeah. So they pretty much have their buffers on anyway. Um, as you probably know, I brought, um, and as we see the physical layout of where the material was, um, you know, most of the material, about 80 to 85% of the material is in the anchorage. Um, you have very little in the So this is the start of the channel. Mm -hmm. You know, this this area is uh, material that's going to be removed. Mm -hmm. um, this is again the 
2018 survey that'll be updated. So okay. this will change. We expect it to change, but this is the, the best information that we have at the moment. So we'll the material there. I think there's around 15 of the 165. About um, 15 or 18 is in the channel itself, and the channel extends right up to like, I think it's here. Mm -hmm. um, but most of your material, as you guys likely know, is um, going to be in the anchorage, which from a dredging standpoint, efficiencies, yeah. is going to be great. It's going to sit and moves. just yeah. get a radius of yeah. wind. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they're, they're not going to have to have a lot of setups moving around. Mm. Um, so I expect it to go pretty quick when they get to that. It, you'll probably see them advance up the channel slowly, but when they get here, you'll see them sort of sit and stay and a lot of scows go out. Um, and you can see on the... A quick look at that would suggest that they would have sufficient access that they could start back true. here and, and just use this for cleanup. Yep, they could do that. And they totally could schedule, do that. Being schedule driven, if you yep. had to walk away from something, those little mm -hmm. parts and parts. Yeah, we're going to, I mean, that, that's the requirement of our construction oversight folks is to make sure they get all that we have asked them to get. Um, but yeah, that's absolutely true. You could definitely maneuver around this stuff to sort of stay in the middle or stay to a side and get right in here and just start on this part um, first. So If they don't finish, and I'm not suggesting that they won't, but yeah. uh, do you put LDs on it? or Yes, what? yes. Yeah. They have a certain... Um, LD, I don't, that'll come out in the yeah, sure. contract, yeah. but it's, you know, several thousand dollars a day that they will be, you know, paying to make sure that, um, and they have such a tight window, and because really what is driving the end of the schedule for the project is right whales at Cape yes. Bay disposal site, we're not going to get an extension into that. Right. You know, there's other situations where... You know, if it was just, say, a winter flounder, we could work with the resource agencies depending upon the temperature and sometimes get, um, you know, an extension for a few days or a week. But in this case, because of the, um, it's an endangered species, we're, mm -hmm. we're not going to be extending um, beyond that. So we've put enough buffer in and we've requested enough, you know, cubic yardage to be yes. taken out every 30 days that we're, you know, we expect them to end before December 31st if they start October 1st. So we've built buffer into it um, so that we don't have to try and worry about the endangered species stuff. Um, if, if they, let's say in the first month they don't get their minimum yardage, um, what, what obligations do they have in the form of a recovery plan? Uh, they would have to present that to us, um, you know, as much as potentially coming back the next year, I mean, I don't want to go no, but no. discuss that stuff without it being happening. But well, can um, you kind of squeeze them if necessary and 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 capable to bring in more equipment? Absolutely, yeah. that would be that would be the easiest solution. Is that yeah. you're not you're not doing what you said you would do in the thirty days. Show us, you know, that you can bring in another dredge, more scows, you know, another tug. You know, because what's really going to be limiting on the project is not the digging, it's going to be the taking it offshore. Yes. Yeah. And that, you know, the travel time back and forth, we're expecting about, you know, six hours round trip to get out to the disposal site and back, you know, and the scout can be filled much quicker than that. Sure. Um, so, you know, having another dredge may not be necessarily beneficial, but adding a tug and, or, a, and another scow might be significantly more beneficial. Yeah. Um, but that's something we will let them propose to us and look at it and evaluate it and, and you know, see where it, where they are in the schedule. And um, But that is one of the reasons why we put a certain cubic yards for 30 days. So 30 days in the project, we're really going to be looking at how are they doing and then, you know, because we don't have a lot of time to sort of mess around. No, say, no, well, you can sort of catch up next month because after that, you're yeah. at the end. So. Craig, if I can interrupt again for one second. This is our shellfish constable. Hi. So she, uh, earlier, and I just sent you an email on this. Oh, okay. um, we would like a list of where the shellfish grants are located. So as they move around, they know areas to avoid. Actually, a map. Yeah, a map would, yeah, would be I have, uh, a graphic. I have PDFs I can email you. Okay. I'll describe your car. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what other questions? 
infrastructure meeting, we talked about proximity to shellfish grains, we talked about staging requirements. The contractor is required to um, get a office for the core team. Um, we're still working out how it's going to be staffed, if it's going to be a five, you know, they're going to be working 24 seven um, for the, for the most of the three months. Though I don't know, based on other projects within our sort of portfolio and what we got going on, if we're going to have folks here five days a week or three days a week, or that's something we'll talk about. We'll probably start heavy and see how the contractor does. Sure. It also depends on the level of comfort we have with the contractor. If it's somebody we've worked with a bunch of times before, that stuff we'll sort of figure out and we'll, you know, we'll talk with the town about it and let you know what's up. And um, That would be an onshore Correct. Facility. Sometimes they put a Connex box, yes. literally like yeah. you probably see it at the harbor and they tie it to electric. So Some more opportunity for that shellfish building, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, but the contractor is required to get that for themselves and for us within a certain mileage of the project. So they may, that might be stuff that they come to you with about at the pre-construction meeting, hey, where, you know, where would the town think is a good office site, they may do it on themselves, you know, on their own and whatnot, but, um, but, so you'll have a presence here from not only the contractor, but from the core to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Okay, good. Um, and I'll be out checking on the project as well. It won't, obviously it won't be at, at a level of uh, a construction rep, but I too will be coming out to see how things are going on, make, make sure you guys are okay and check in and, um, you know, concern about potential sound and light and all that kind of stuff. I want to make sure that we're on top of that so that, you know, the citizens of Wellfleet get a great project at the least impact possible to themselves, so. Does this, um, you, you may or may not know that, is there enough fuel storage capacity on the barge to allow that machine to work without refueling? Oh, no, they'll, they'll definitely be um, setting up fuel um, deliveries to the harbor, um, they—that's all on them, you know. Yep. But that's more information that probably could be gathered at the pre-construction meeting. You know, if you guys know of marine diesel providers in the area, give them a list, and I'll call around. Would they better. bring it in by barge or by truck? truck. I, yeah, probably. Are they going to have to back that thing up yes. to the pier or take a boat with us? You know what? I don't. I, don't, I can't say. Kilometers. Ask. We've seen it done both ways. We've seen. Trucks pull up and fill up the dredge, or fill up uh, a work boat that then offloads it into the dredge. Um, we've seen come by water. It really does the contract. Have you ever had to deal with a, a fuel spill? <laughs> yes, we have. And the, How does that work? Generally, they're very, that's all in our environmental protection plan. Mm -hmm. um, when you say spill, I'm talking, you know, <laughs> a few gallons. We've never, I've never known to have some very large spill. It, it, you know, you're, you're just filling up a, a crane, um, but they have, they're required to have certain booms and certain environmental containments and all that kind of stuff as a part of the project. Good. So. Are they required to have a plan though for a larger fuel spill, for example? Are they required to have a plan and presumably a third party, like a clean harbor right. so on 24 hour? Yeah, so I, I went ahead and sent you guys a like Today, I, yeah, yeah, I, I didn't get a chance to. It, yeah, it's like two or three hundred pages. Yeah. So that will outline sort of, you'll see the requirements of, you know, environmental protection and that Great. kind of stuff. So if there's question, you have concerns, we can talk about it. Okay. Um, but the word, it's a pretty standard thing we do for every dredge project. Um, so. Okay. That could be a big bubble. Yeah, right, a big spill. Well, the shellfish beds are so close yeah, to it. Yeah, we understand. Well, yeah. Yeah. We have to at least it's, ask the question. Or, oh, sure. Absolutely. It's just like not getting knowledge of having a disease that covers the whole world, so it happens. So, yeah, but the, that stuff, we... we Whatever are you? <laughs> I was going to say, are we practicing social spacing here? <laughs> you're, you're closer than six feet. So I see you noticed. <laughs> um... But yeah, all, we, these contractors work, especially the mm -hmm. unrestricted. And now, could a small business do it? Absolutely. Um, but 
even the small businesses, they're used to working in waters where there's shellfish, where there's eelgrass habitat, mm. you know, they, and it, we, that's why we're here to observe them, is to make sure that they're doing things not only from a sort of execution and production way, but also from a safety and an environmental way. Oh, yeah. So um, that's the role of the core in the project uh, and the oversight stuff. So. Okay. Um, it's just sort of piggyback dredging. Piggyback dredging. You, so, get, to, you get to go first. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, as long as the, the contractor finishes our stuff first, yeah. since we are paying, there is obvious benefits to piggyback dredging. And sure. The federal government pays for the significant mobilization. Cost, mobilization and demobilization. You know, projects <laughs> like this can run half a million to a million dollars just for the mobilization, just to get everything here. Mm -hmm. So we recognize there's savings, um, but we're always gonna tell the contractor, you know, we brought you here, we want you to do our work first. And as a matter of fact, you, they really can't do your work until they do ours. You can't physically do right. yeah, 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 no, we yeah. understand. Um, so with that, and the fact, I mean, we would never stop you guys from reaching out to the contractor and saying, hey, can you, you know, can you work on this too? I, I think that the window's gonna be entirely taken up by the CORE's project, so I, they might be able to start. Well, you know, 90,000 yards a month would be a nicer number. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it would. Faster tugs. <laughs> more tugs. Yeah, more yeah. scows. More dredges. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, that when you start to increase that, that, that may shift into two dredges. When, yeah. you know, stuff that we don't. I, we either could don't. Need. But I, I can appreciate it. It usually yeah. takes five to six hours to fill one of those, doesn't it? Yeah. Skies. Five right? to six hours. Are they 2,500 yards? Um, I think we're looking at anywhere. It really depends upon you know the the makeup of the contractors out there who are going to be bidding the project. We have some contractors that have thousand yard scowls. Um, I don't think you're probably going to be able to get much bigger than a 3,000 cubic yard scale in here only because of the draft. Um, I think Cashman had 2,500 yards yeah. last night. I, you know, Could that be specified in your bid? We don't want to specify. Right. That's just going to they make it more yeah. yeah, We just say come in, do it in this amount of time, do it with this you know yeah. this kind of bucket, so it's not you know preventing. Maybe they only have five thousand yard budget. Yeah, they they could only half fill them. That that would be totally up to them to yeah. sort of figure out. You know they might have all their fifteen hundred or two thousand yard scows on another project where they can't take them away, and they've got a. But the draft on some of those really large scows is you know fifteen eighteen feet, so you you know you just can't get them in here. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, like I said, I don't think it's going to be the dredging, the actual physical dredging part that's going to be the limiting factor. I think it's going to be no. the, the taking it out of here. Would be nice to get that contractor to do it because we'd suddenly have a sellable boat ramp, <laughs> <laughs> which is big money to us. Yeah, sure, sure. Plus getting to the boat ramp early on rather right than... Well, he's not going to let you do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well. Well, I mean, if you finish in that extra time, say, of two or three weeks. Yeah. Oh, you mean you're stuck beyond? After yeah. your work is done. Yeah. yeah. And we haven't rubbed up against the right. window slamming sure. shut. Sure. That would be the time we... To do it. We do it. But when do we... Uh, how do we work out a contract for that? Would it have to be during while they're we, doing this? Uh, we, would, we would bid it. Know contingencies who the proposed bidders are for that, yeah. And we bid it as a contingent plan. And explain we would, uh, it would be based on what the final quantity is or, or what the final area is. And the reason I say that is that whole area there, the L Pier, and mm. is 66,000 yards. I think we would, if, if it came to it, we would be content with doing a portion of it, the critical piece that gets us to and from the ramp, yeah. Uh, you know, at least get that. That's where our money so, is. So, you know, call it 20000 a third of the area, and then mm. that would be beneficial to us. So we could structure the bid package uh, along those lines, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds reasonable. Oh, that's great. Uh, any other questions for Craig? 
So follow up. We'll read the documents and we'll yeah, have any questions. Nice. Appreciate that. You're going to do a support letter. This is for our, our application for uh, the mass dredging program. Okay. So it's on a kind of a short timeline. We're working GEI. The 2020 form just came out. Right. Yeah, I guess well, a couple that. weeks ago. Yeah. So they're working on it and then we'll be gathering the documents and uh, a very pertinent one would be a letter of support from you. Sure. Um, extol yeah, exactly. Extolling the virtues of our yeah, the embellishments and the key things that you can think of that are substantial would help because it's a competitive bid process. Sure. And then we, meaning Nancy, will provide the map for yep. where the grants are. Yeah. Okay. Then, Did yeah. you address um, the other shellfish community issues that I had sent to For a now? contingency plan? For example, yeah, there was like four or five different. Uh, we we didn't. That's a good point. It takes just a minute. Yep. Um, he touched on it maybe with the uh, with the bucket, but one of the items would be that the scows would be closed sealed. So there's no. Oh sure. Yeah. yeah that's that's right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Comes, that's comes with the territory, I assume. Right. Um, and the oil. That was it. Oh, uh, hydraulic oil would be uh, food grade. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And those were the two key ones that I remember, Nancy, without looking at the list. Yeah, I'm, I, it doesn't download to my phone. I thought I did. Yeah. Nancy, I will give you Craig's contact information so oh, you can great. send him the maps and ask him any questions that you might have. Will do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think you were here. The um, the bucket is a requirement of the water quality cert. We have a closed environmental bucket. Okay. It has like a flange, so when it closes, it sort of pushes water out at at the point of scoop, and then you know, sort of close as it comes up through the water column. So that's going to limit as much as we can, you know, sort of the, the um, turbidity in the water at, as a process of the dredge bucket going up and down. Okay. So. Um, and that made me think of something else. So uh, when the dredge comes into the channel, uh, is there like a, a specific uh, width that it covers. So I've been asked recently, you know, will it come up a little bit onto the sides of the channel? Um, and this is again because aquaculture grants there, but also because right now uh, we just started a program today to allow draggers in there. It's normally an area that's close to shell fishing right. um, by boat, uh, but we're trying to harvest our um, shellfish resources before they come and get taken Pull out. out. Trend, right. <laughs> right. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out, should I let them um, fish a little bit on the sides yeah. as long, again, as it's not interrupted. There's a 25 buff, uh, foot buffer zone from grants, Okay. Um, but there is some extra area there, and if the dredge is going to be going over that area, then I'd want to make sure to rescue the yeah. so resources. I think, this, I think you were not here when we talked a little bit about the dredge prism. So, um, obviously the channel is sort of an imaginary line with a certain width that goes up. Mm -hmm. But we can't dredge just straight down because the material will slump in. So we have a, a what we call a three-on-one ratio, uh, which is a dredge cut that we will actively dredge outside of the channel itself to obtain that three-on-one ratio. And we have it in the plans. Um, but if you want, just generally, you know, it's ten-foot channel and three-to-one is thirty feet. So where you have a channel thirty feet beyond that, expect you know, some activity by the dredge. So the, uh, the channel's 10 feet wide and then about 30 feet to get that 3 to 1. Yeah, well, the, the, the channel's, channel's well over 100, 100 feet. Yeah, 125 okay, sorry. feet. I'm, I'm it's like if you're feet. driving down the Mid-Cape through some of the hills that they cut down to make the flat road surface, yeah. Yeah. you know, the, the sides of the bankings are flared. Okay. Well, the channel, consider the pavement yes. on the road. The top of the bankings are way back from the edge of the road. So okay. to make a long story short, shellfish could be disturbed 30 feet yeah. to one side of the line, which would be the edge of the channel. Okay, that's great to know. So what they would want to do is have enough notice to move stock 50 feet back and they would be safe. I was just going to drag 30 feet other side, either side of the channel. And yeah. yeah. So, so the actual prescribed dimensions are 125 wide. Well, it, cha it actually changes. Okay. I mean, it gets yeah. sort of wide. Variable width. Oh, right. I, I want to say for the most part, it's 125 foot width. <clears throat> and 10 deep. 
Yes. And um, it gets a little wider right at the point where it starts to come around to the anchorage. I think it gets to maybe 200, 200 feet wide, and then it goes to full 400 feet wide for the anchorage. 10 deep plus a foot of overdrive. Correct. In the sides of the mooring basin would be under the same slope ratio. Exactly. Three so you'll get some of your stuff dredged. <laughs> well, yeah. have, you know, section they can drop them into a, slope. a little sliver that'll yeah. come with us. How about about a hundred and forty foot <laughs> slope ratio? Right here. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Um, what happens if we move the boobies? <laughs> <laughs> this stuff. That's one of the things about dredging is all this stuff you see on a map is loaded directly into dredge software. So there's no like, oh, somebody moved the buoy yeah, over that way. We, we got to continue to dredge that way. <laughs> no, this is all, they, they've got like literally in the software they do, they, they see how many scoops they've gotten per one area so they can figure out. It's really for efficiency and maximization of, of their effort. Um, so. Yeah, I saw that yesterday in New Bedford where they're doing up the uh, polluted material from the yeah. PCBs, yeah. Mm -hmm. and it doesn't have a very big bucket. Chris, no, I'm not talking. But they're nice they're, they're programmed program yeah. to go down. Yeah, uh, yeah. And pick up this piece here. That's skip right. this piece, and then go to this other piece. Right. They have that, and that's also hydraulic dredging. They have very prescriptive depths they go to because they don't want to uncover things. Or they don't want to suck up stuff that they don't have to because they have to clean that material. Stuff is clean here. You don't have to worry they, about. They used that. up most of their money. Too. Yes, they have. It's expensive. They've got to do that a lot kind of left to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry about that here, well, though. No. Okay. Anything else? Why can't you do the whole job for us? <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say. The, the I mean, it's a little late now, given the. But we have done projects for communities um, that provide the funding to the core. You know, like in the state of Connecticut, we've done a number of projects. Even if we don't have, like, we don't have the money to do, let's say, for example, somewhere in Connecticut wants a project done, they have actually paid us to do our federal navigation project plus some of their stuff. Um, only because they figure they, they can't wait. They, you know, right. we can't wait for the federal government to, you know, get to us because we don't rise to the level that, that we need, they need us to, to get the funding. So... But yes, piggyback dredging, that's the other type of piggyback dredging is that you just fold your work into ours. But at this point, with where we are, um, we'd have already had to have like an MOA set up and funds you would have already had to have, all that kind of stuff before we went out to a contract. And it doesn't know. extend the dredging window. <clears throat> no. Way, so the, the sequence would still be bifurcated into three years. Cor correct. Yeah. yeah. The only advantage we might be able to get is being able to pull it off in two. But it's so much material, I still think it'd probably be three. Yeah. Um, so it's, I, I don't think we're really gaining anything, even if you were to try and package it together. Um, so. All right. Well, we really appreciate you coming. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Really cool. Absolutely. I'm really looking stay forward. Stay close, stay in touch. Yeah, yeah I'll, and I'll let you know as we get through this big milestones, like a RFP and, or a pre-solicitation. So. When we have the bid opening, we always go at least 15 days ahead of the bid opening to let contractors know, hey, we're getting ready to put this out, be ready. You know, so it gives them a sort of advanced look. That's at least 15 days, it may even be a little bit more, but I'll, I'll send you notifications. Okay. Saying, hey, we put out the pre-solicitation notice and I'll send it to you. Because we also, you know, we don't know who does what out there all the time. So that if the town knows of contractors that it potentially might be interested, we say, hey, make sure that they are they know so that they can bid on the project. Okay. Because um, we want it to be as competitive as possible. Um, so these um, <coughs> contractors that you're going out to, you're going to know whether or not they were able to do this type of material versus, say, sand? The, um, yeah, I mean, dredging contractors, they, unless it was like hard rock, um, Anybody who can dredge sand can dredge this, or vice versa. Um, so it's more uh, both on equipment availability and yeah. resource availability. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. That, and what what other projects are the dredging contractors already working on? Can we fit this in? Um, 
So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Okay. Okay.